Whatever happened to the possibility of the return of the 100% bonus depreciation? Is that still in play? And there was also word that the Biden administration would unleash hundreds of auditors into the system. Did that ever happen? I'm Kathy Fetke, and welcome to The Real Wealth Show. You're listening to The Real Wealth Show with Kathy Fetke, the real estate investor's resource. We're going to get an update today from CPA Brandon Hall, owner of Hall CPA, an accounting firm that specializes in helping real estate investors and business owners build tax smart portfolios. And I'm pleased to say that I will be the keynote speaker at their upcoming virtual event, the Tax and Legal Summit. You can get details in the show notes. But Brandon, welcome to The Real Wealth Show. Thanks for having me, Kathy. I'm excited to be here. Well, there's so many things I want to talk about. There's changes. There's lots of changes, potentially a change in leadership in the U.S., also possibly an update to the bonus depreciation that has been dwindling, and maybe we'll come back with a vengeance. <laughs> um, so, yeah, let's start there because I know a lot of people are wondering where the where it stands with the, let's see, it's the Tax Relief for American Families and Workers Bill. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. The Tax Relief for American Families and Workers Act. So that, so that was passed by the House. It was actually overwhelming, um, overwhelmingly passed by the House a couple months ago. And then it has sat in the Senate for some time now. Um, and it's still in the Senate looking to hopefully be passed. Uh, a lot of professionals think that it's dead. But there is one update that I, uh, I do want to touch on. But the importance with this, at least for real estate investors, is um, 100% bonus depreciation will be retroactive to 2023. So bonus depreciation has been 100% since the 2017 Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, meaning that if you get a cost segregation study performed on your rentals, uh, you can 100% expense any component with a useful life of less than 20 years. And a cost segregation study, the whole purpose is to allocate value to 5, 7, and 15-year property, all of which have a useful life of less than 20 years. So if you do a cost segregation study, you get to write off a big chunk of that purchase price in the first year of ownership. Awesome for real estate investors. 2023, 100% phases down to 80%. 2024, it's 60%. 2025, 40%, and so on and so forth until we hit 0% in 2027. So everybody's been talking over the past couple of years, especially in the cost seg space and the 1031 space, that there's uh, the expectation is that there will be extensions to bonus depreciation to some degree. We don't know if it's 100% or 50%. It's been 50% for a really long time before the 2017 Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. So we thought this was going to be the bill. Uh, it was a very popular bill. There were some other things in there too, like the R&D tax credits. Uh, if you're running a software company right now, you have to amortize those R&D costs. You can no longer deduct them in the first year. So uh, very painful for uh, painful surprise for anybody running software businesses. So there's a lot of positives in this bill, and uh, and, and the House again just passed it overwhelmingly. So we thought the Senate it was a shoe in, but then it stalled. Uh, we, you know, we had a bunch of clients on extension waiting to see if this was going. I know that was kind of like the industry move. Is if you're a real estate CPA, you are putting your clients on extension because there's so much this bonus depreciation potential. But uh, but it's stalled. But um, it's not all hope is not lost. So there is a there's a bill. That actually, it's passed. I don't I don't know when this is going to release. We're recording this on five nine. Uh, but tomorrow five ten, the Federal Aviation Administration um, has to be reauthorized. Like their budget has to be reauthorized, and so one hundred percent bonus depreciation has been thrown in uh, as a rider essentially to that. So they they will. Tomorrow, fight about 100% bonus depreciation. We will find out tomorrow <laughs> whether or not this is going to happen. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Okay. Well, I'll have to do an update on my Instagram on that. <laughs> so There you go. Yeah. I know this out. is probably going to come out a little bit later. But anyway, <laughs> on May 10th, we found out <laughs> what was going to happen. Okay. Yeah. I try to keep more up to date on Instagram. So anyone who wants to do that, I'm just Kathy Fedke. I think I'm the only one. Uh, you, who else has got that name? It's, it means little fatty in German. I think somebody said that. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, we're all uh, rooting, rooting over here for that. 
Yeah. Now, something I just that you brought up that I think is really important for our listeners to understand is extensions. Um, you just said a strategy has been to, um, you know, coach or, you know, tell clients it's probably better to extend. Uh, so many people in our syndications want, you know, to file on time in April. We're like, we manage 15 different syndications. You actually want to wait. Tell me if I'm right or wrong on that. If you're invested in passive income type things like syndications, why would you want to file an extension? So my, my theory on why people want to file extensions, uh, I've, got, I've got two theories and they might be combined. I don't know. But the first is we all grew up going to school that had arbitrary deadlines that we had to meet, right? Mm -hmm. So we, we have been taught over decades that deadlines are extremely important and that we must meet the deadlines. Otherwise it's late and you get a failing grade. <laughs> um, so when people see the, the 315 deadline and the 415 deadline, they just think I have to hit that deadline. I cannot extend. I get punished if I extend, which is not true, but I think it's just so ingrained in who we are that I think that's a big contributing factor that nobody really talks about. But the second thing that I, that I think happens, especially for more sophisticated uh, investors and more sophisticated or higher income folks, more sophisticated, um, you know, business people is they extend, they go to October 15th, then they, they, they get their returns back from their accountants. They owe money, but they also owe penalties and interest on top of that. And so I think what they do, the purpose of not wanting an extension is to, is in their mind is a way to avoid penalties and interest from accruing on any unpaid tax bill. Because you, even if you extend the time to file, you still have to pay the bill by 415. Mm -hmm. And if you don't pay the bill by 415, penalties and interest start accruing. So I think that's what is going on there is, is just this, this kind of stop gap for, uh, for the penalties. But if you, if you have a competent CPA group, you can get estimates performed. Um, you can get projections performed and they can get very close to what you would actually owe um, or be refunded. And, and then you can base, you know, quarterly estimated tax payments on that information. And now you don't have to worry about a 415 tax filing. Um, so, I mean, we, we love our clients that extend. It gives us a lot more time to make sure that everything's accurate. Uh, you know, the worst thing is, trying to push your tax account on 410, 411, or 412 to get your return done because that accountant's burned out by that point, right? Um, so we love our clients that want to extend. We work with them on it. But yeah, it's it's your story is the same with all the GPs that we work with. There's always investors that will be knocking down your door saying, I want my return today uh, or I need my K1 today so that I can file. Um, and it's typically one of those two things that I just mentioned is, is kind of going on under under the surface. Yeah, I, I mean, it just makes sense. See, you're not going to get your CPA on the phone in April when you need them. Right. So, you know, I, I would say from what I've seen, the higher net worth investors, the um, professional investors, they, they always extend. So I want to keep getting that word out. Uh, but also, there has been a rumor that that can uh, reduce your audit risk. Is that still true? Uh, I mean, the, the IRS has a three-year statute of limitations to pull your return for audit. Um, I don't know that there's any true data that that can support that, but that is like the kind of what the industry says. I, I, I think that the industry tells people that to try to convince you to extend <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so that you can have more time to work on your return. So I don't want to like spread false or yeah. potentially false information, but I will say that there's nothing wrong with extending. Um, I think that it it does reduce your audit risk in the sense that uh, you are probably less likely to have errors in your return if you extend because there's mm -hmm. more time to work on it. You're not working on it in the middle, in the height of tax season when everybody's burned out. Um, so I think from that perspective, it definitely does reduce your audit risk. Uh, but does the timing itself matter? I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> Yeah. And then as far as paying, yeah, absolutely. You need to have your estimates done. We always estimate estimate high so that maybe we will get that refund. I love a good refund. Uh, but yeah, just because you don't want to be made, writing a check, right? So right. <laughs> overestimate, pay, and then yeah, deal with it later. Um, so let's talk about audits. There has been this fear, or I, it's not even a fear, it's a reality that the Biden administration was going to increase audits. Is that happening? 
Uh, so yeah, that, that's that's what the the word is. Um, mm-hmm. I've not seen you know the results of that specifically, uh, but we were kind of talking before we turned this on that what we have seen, what we've experienced, is an increase in real estate professional status audits. Uh, so I, I wrote a like a guide or an ebook on real estate professional status. I think it was like back in 2020, and ever since then we've always had a couple audits trickle in uh, a year. Uh, just a handful. Mm-hmm. Um, people want to, people are being audited for real estate professional status. Their accountant doesn't know how to help them. So they call us and say, can you please come in and review my time log and all the regulations? And, you know, can you help me navigate this recently? And when I say recently, I mean, over the past, like four to six months, uh, we've had like three to four of these a month. And, uh, and so I don't know what's going on. I don't know if we're just way better at marketing than we were four years ago. Um, maybe that's part of it, but, uh, that's a lot in our world. That's a lot of audits. So, uh, I think it's, it's to the point where we've even thought about like actually offering this as a go to market service. It's not really like, I mean, it's something we do, but we're not like throwing it out there that we do this thing for all these people. But now we're looking at, okay, do we go hire a tax resolution team and actually, actually do this for people? Is this something that is going to continue? Um, and I think it is going to be something that continues. I, I think that as the IRS becomes smarter, smarter by implementing better technology, implementing AI, and that's, you know, years off, but still, as they do these things, as they make these investments, they become smarter, they become more targeted, uh, they become much better at resource management. And it's going to be people that are taking tax positions that uh, look not good on paper, right? And what are those? Those are, uh, I'm taking large real estate losses when I have a W2 job or when I run a business full time. That's non real estate related. And there are reasons to do that, right? Maybe my spouse qualifies as a real estate professional and she legitimately qualifies because she stays at home and she manages our portfolio. Or maybe we're running the short term rental, you know, quote unquote loophole that's out there. We're buying short term rentals. We are materially participating. You can do those things and still deduct tax losses against your W 2 income. This is what a lot of our high, high income clients do. But it's still a flag for audit. So I think that we're going to see a lot more of these pop up over time as the IRS gets better at, man- at managing their resources. And let's just really quickly talk about how you can get through that audit easier than not. Um, we were audited for that very thing uh, for professional real estate status. My husband's a real estate broker. We're obviously <laughs> real estate professionals. So it was kind of laughable. But still, um, you know, we had to prove. So Rich was, Rich is very organized and he had all his time, um, spent on our properties. And fortunately we owned some properties nearby where he was actually physically working on them. Uh, and he, and he had put everything in his calendar, every conversation, every time he did anything. So it was pretty easy for him to, to prove. But how can people not dread these audits because they're so buttoned up that it's not anything to worry about? So I think that if people approach it like like it sounds like Rich did, that's how you don't dread it, right? Mm-hmm. You, I think if you are playing the game of real estate or just business in general, you should expect to get audited at some point. Just expect mm-hmm. it. So don't, yeah. don't fear it. Just expect it. And when you can shift from I hope I don't get audited to I will get audited, you, you make that mindset shift. Now you just change how you document your day to day and the different expenses that you have. And that's the key. If, if you are able to show really solid documentation that you did everything you were supposed to do, the audits are not going to be bad. Like the most of the people, m- most of the agents that are auditing, especially at this type of stuff, they're pretty smart. And, you know, when mm-hmm. they when they know that they've got you, they're going to dig in hard. Right. Mm-hmm. But when they see, oh, yeah, you've got everything documented they're just going to move on to the next issue and they're going to test a few different issues, make sure you are documented across the board. And then they're just going to move on. They're going to close the audit and move on. Um, and, that, and that's been our experience helping people with real estate au- professional status audits as well is most of the people that are calling us up uh, either don't have a time log. So that means they're retroactively creating it, which when you're doing that under audit is not good. Ideally, <laughs> they get audited. They make the document request tomorrow. I'm sending them my time log, not, not can I get an extension? Can we do this and play this game for sixty days? Um, you know that all that's in the in the agent's mind triggering is this person doesn't actually have a time log. Uh, so first is you have to have a time log, 
But the second is like that time lock has to be accurate. It's got to match your credit card statements, bank statements. Like and what I mean by that is if you say in your time log that you're at the rental property or that you went and bought materials or whatever, but your credit card statement shows that you're in Cancun traveling, <laughs> um, that's not going to be good, right? You're going to lose. Uh, so, so you have to, uh, most of the people that, that need our help don't have a time log or on the time log, they've recorded a bunch of what I call junk hours, which is education, research hours, investor level time. There are CPAs out there that say, yeah, inv- education counts. It does not count every it time. No, education. Oh, I always thought it did. No, 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 no. It's a, oh, it, no. It's got to be personal services for your rental property, your operations. Education okay. time is not going to count. Where the education time could count is like for Rich, exam- for, for Rich, for example, if if he needed um, CPE, a continuing ed, to maintain his licensure, fine. But if I'm listening to this podcast or attending a, a, an event or something, that time is not going to count for real estate professional status because it doesn't impact your ability to collect rents or pay your bills on your rental property. 99 times out of 100. Could you slide in a special webinar about how to do stuff? Sure. But you're not going to slide in 150 hours of education time. But a lot of people try to do that because well, I think that people are. I think there's CPAs selling that. There are CPAs selling that. <laughs> and I've actually, I think I've had them out, on the show. <laughs> I've reached out to a couple of them, and I've get, I've said, "Hey, here's the citation," and they go, "Oh crap!" <laughs> so there oh are CPAs goodness. selling it. Um, and you got to okay. be careful. You got to be really careful. But in the regulations, it's very clear, and that's what's shocking is that I think that. I think that there are tax pros that simply don't read the regulations. Oh, um, so that's not helpful. No. Uh, okay, very good. All right, so again, this is professional real estate status, but there's all kinds of things like okay, lo- right there. What? Let's just start with that because basically, if you you can re- greatly reduce your taxes if one of you, a married couple, if one of you is not working full time and is spending, what is it? 150 hours materially on their properties. Yeah. So it's, so they have to spend, so your spouse, if they're not working full time, um, they need to spend 750 hours and more time in real estate than anywhere else. So it's it's a two prong test, 750 and more time in real estate. Uh, And if you can do that, you can qualify as a real estate professional. Now there's also 11, real property trades or businesses that the time qualifies for. So like, like if you are running a, uh, like an education company, for example, that talks about real estate all the time, that's not a real property trade or business. So none of that time counts for real estate professional status. I'm a CPA. I provide tax advice to landlords. That's all we do. But none of my time counts for real estate professional status because I'm running a service firm. I'm not running a real property trader business. So there's only 11 real property trades of businesses. Th- those, in those businesses, you log 750 hours and more time in those businesses than my day job, my CPA firm business. You're a real estate professional if you can do that. And if you can qualify as a real estate professional, and if you can also show that you materially participated in your rentals, so that's the second kind of threshold here. But if you can do those two things, your rentals can, ne- the losses from your rentals can now offset your active income. And that's really powerful in any year that we're acquiring rental real estate because we can, again, cost seg, bonus depreciate. We can create large tax losses on paper that are not real operating losses. I, the, the property could cash flow, but I could tell the IRS I lost 100K. Uh, and, and that's a, that happens all the time in, in the years that we are acquiring property. And if I can use that hundred K tax loss to offset my W2 income or my business income, now we're talking about some pretty significant tax savings. So that's the whole purpose of pursuing the real estate professional status designation, um, is to, to capture those, those paper losses that are generated from the rental activities. And this is how so many, say, doctors or, you know, high net worth people, if their spouse is not working, um, then, and that, that spouse can qualify, it, it can bring the, uh, the tax bill down to what I, you know, of course we've seen to nothing. Um, so what are some of those 11 <laughs> trades? <laughs> yeah. So the 11 real property trades or businesses are like property management, uh, brokerage, um, uh, rental management. So, so or operating your rentals. So if you're a landlord, for example, you're, you're in 
and then it's uh, development, redevelopment, and there's a whole slew of of other ones that I can't remember off the top of my head. Okay. Oh, so yeah. good to know. <laughs> All right. But uh, so in logging, when you say properly logging, like, should you have a separate book? I mean, he, Rich has put it in his calendar, but you should actually have a book where you're logging your time. No, you and don't how need much, that. how much material time, um, are we talking? Yeah. So, so, uh, so real estate professional status, again, is 750 hours more time in real estate than anywhere else. Um, but you also have to show that you materially participated in your rentals and, in material participation, there's seven tests for material participation. It's 500 hours, uh, 100 hours more than anyone else, and substantially all my time. Uh, or my time is substantially all the time on the property. Those are three separate tests. There's four more that nobody ever pursues. So mm -hmm. the three tests that we really see our clients pursuing, again, are 500 hours, 100 hours, and more than anyone else. Or my time is basically all the time. I self-manage the property. Um, the reason that material participation is important and I want to be really clear because, again, there's there's uh, what I feel is is bad information in terms of, you know, there's there's a difference between real estate professional status hours and material participation hours. There's not a difference between these two. These are just two separate sets of tests that an hour for real estate professional status is going to count for an hour for material participation. An hour for material participation is going to count for an hour for real estate professional status. What I what I want to make sure people understand, though, is that it's not about hitting 500 hours of material participation and then spending 250 hours of quote anything else to achieve real estate professional status. Again, that's, that's coming from, I haven't read the regulations and I don't understand how this actually works. So an hour is an hour is an hour. It's all the same. You have to get 750 material participation hours in a real property trader business in order to qualify as a real estate professional. But here's where the difference occurs. If I'm a real estate agent and I spend 2000 hours a year being a real estate agent, I am a real estate professional, right? I spent 750 hours, right? I spent 2000. So I, so I meet that test and I didn't do anything else. That was the only thing that I did. So full-time real estate agent. So I also meet the second test, spend more time in real estate than anywhere else. I did that. So I'm a real estate professional. But if I don't go and materially participate on my rental properties, they are still passive. So I could be a real estate professional, but my rentals could still be passive. So I, I have to remember to go and manage my rentals. And I could I could self-manage my rentals at that point. And and the material participation test of your time is is significantly all the time. I would I would pass that test. So I don't have to like put forth a great effort as long as I'm self-managing, doing all the work myself. But if anybody else is involved, now I'm looking at 100 hours more than anyone else. If I have a large portfolio, now I'm looking at 500 hours across the entire portfolio that I have to self-manage these rentals or, or, or manage these rentals. So that's that's where the the kind of the, the threshold difference comes from, um, is when I'm a developer, I'm a wholesaler, I'm a builder, I'm a property manager for third-party clients. I'm a real estate agent. I'm probably going to be a real estate professional just by doing those things. But if I don't remember to come back and materially participate on my own rentals, my rentals will still be passive. So that's why that, that second test, that second tier of testing, that material participation test exists. Well, I'm, I'm just, gosh, I learned something every time I think I'd know this stuff by heart, but um, well, my husband was kind of laughing at me because we, I do manage our short-term rentals and he's like, you, there's much better uh, use of your time, but maybe not. Maybe I just need to keep managing those. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. hundred uh, percent. And short-term rentals are a completely different beast because, mm -hmm. you know, as I'm sure that, you know, short-term rentals are not considered rental activities under the internal revenue code. Well, real estate professional status only applies to rental activities. Um, so that's, this is where like all the physicians go, okay, I'm going to go buy a short-term rental because Real estate professional status has the test spend more time in real estate than anywhere else. So if you are a full-time physician or you're a full-time business owner that's not running a real estate business, uh, you can't be a real estate professional. You can't justify that you spent more time in real estate than you did at your full-time job. Yeah. But a, but that only applies to short to uh, to rental properties. A short-term rental is not a rental property under the Internal Revenue Code. It's weird, but all it means is you can buy short-term rentals and not have to worry about the two real estate professional status tests, which were 750 hours and more time in real estate than anywhere else. All you have to worry about is material participation, which again is 
500 hours, 100 hours, and more than anyone else, or my participation is significantly all the participation, i.e. I self-managed everything top to bottom. So if you can meet one of those tests on a short-term rental, then you can claim all the losses against your active income without qualifying as a real estate professional. Okay, so bottom line, don't don't try this at home by yourself. <laughs> don't go do an online course and think you can handle it. Uh, just for the record, uh, your company has been managing our rental fund, and you guys are just awesome. Thank and you. you also have a virtual event, which I love because you can just learn in your living room in your pajamas. Um, I'm going to be the keynote for that coming yes. up. So if you would just give people some information on how to sign up for that. Yeah, well, we're very excited to have you. Looking forward to it. This is uh, the Tax, Legal, and Wealth Summit. Uh, we've we've run this summit multiple years in a row. We didn't run it last year. We took a break, uh, but we're bringing it back. It's a virtual summit, multi-day event. Uh, we just keep a Zoom room open all day and you kind of come in and out as you want. Um, but if you want to register or want to check out the speakers and the agenda, you can go to www.taxandlegalsummit.com um, and you can sign up. And we'll have that link in the show notes. All right, Brandon, you you're, you and your company are just, man, it just seems like you have a, you are the real estate investor or CPA. Like this is what you guys do and you obviously know it inside and out. So thank yeah. you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. We've been really impressed with the fund and the fund is certainly not easy easy accounting. <laughs> 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 All right. Well, wonderful. Uh, thank you so much for being here on The Real Well Show, and we'll see you at the summit. Appreciate it. If you'd like to build a tax smart portfolio, visit realwealthshow.com. It's free to join and you'll get access to property teams in some of the fastest growing markets and areas where there is still cash flow, but there's also appreciation. I love the combo. You can speak with our investment counselors for free. They are very experienced and also invest in these same markets with these same teams. And they talk to thousands of our investors to get feedback on where the best returns have been. So again, you can check that out at realwealthshow.com. And we're all still accepting investment in our Ridgewater development in Oregon. Uh, you can check that out under the syndications part or at growdevelopments.com. I'm Kathy Fedke. Thanks for joining me here on The Real Wealth Show. We'll see you next time. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are provided for informational purposes only and should not be construed as an offer to buy or sell any securities or to make or consider any investment or course of action. For more information, go to realwealthshow.com.